Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Investigative Journal. I'm Tal Heinrich in New York. Our focus today is on China and a tragedy that is hard to imagine could happen in the 21st century. The victims are the Uyghur community, Muslims who trace their roots back thousands of years in Central Asia. And they represent 1% of China's population. Most Uyghurs live in the Chinese region of Xinjiang that Uyghurs refer to as East Turkestan. This Muslim minority has endured what U.S. calls one of the worst human rights crises of modern times. The U.N. estimates that out of the 11 million Uyghurs, close to 1 million are languishing in re-education centers. Some call them concentration camps, where innocent people are shackled, tortured, isolated from their families and detained without trials or official charges. The Chinese Communist Party maintains these centers are part of its efforts to counter terrorism and separatism. A reasoning that has sparked global protests as more and more horrific stories surface from within the Uyghur community. To hear more about this minority, we're joined by Mr. Nuri Turkel, a U.S.-based Uyghur rights advocate, the former president of the Uyghur American Association, and an attorney. Turkel himself was born in a re-education camp in China's Xijiang region. Great to have you on the show. Mr. Nuri, how many years have you been in these re-education camps? How did you make it out? I was born at the height of the Cultural Revolution, uh, but you never thought, you know, this history repeats itself in such a strange way. But then it was uh, the nationwide, more like an ideological uh, campaign. But this one, the, the new one uh, that the Chinese government specifically uh, uh, set up uh, to destroy Uyghur century, centuries old cultural and ethnic identity with a genocidal intent, it's very different. And it's happening in daylight. You know, in you, um, uh, those of us who are a student of history been told that never again, but never again is happening again in China uh, for the Uyghurs uh, as we speak. Uh, the Chinese government has been put on defense uh, since August uh, UN panel uh, last year uh, called out the Chinese for creating this no rights zone. Well, 22 countries signed a joint letter last July, uh, you know, to the UN Human Rights Council urging China to close these camps. What has happened to that? China's government has been um, effectively um, and, and very aggressively engaging in disinformation campaign uh, to, to the Uyghurs' disadvantage. They have managed to buy out silence from majority Muslim countries that include Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, Pakistan, even Turkey. That's uh, so outrageous. It, How? It is outrageous. And, and the, the irony is that uh, when something else uh, or something in a smaller scale happened to any type of Muslim people, you will hear uh, a street protest. You will see a street protest and condemnation. But here, the Chinese government specifically calling Uyghur Islam as a mental illness. And we see uh, MBS going to Beijing, shaking hand with Chinese uh, leader, and even phrasing. And then we have Imran, people like Imran Khan, uh, asked in major uh, TV network uh, at least three times, is feigning ignorance. And then recently, Mahathir of uh, Malaysia came out, and he was pretty honest, uh, but he said that we cannot irritate the Chinese. So the Chinese government has effectively created this false division in the world, uh, pro-Uyghur or pro-humanity versus well, against humanity. China claims the government, the Communist Party says that this is part of their counter-extremism, right. counter-radicalization right. efforts to eradicate terrorism. Have Uyghurs, Uyghurs been engaged in any kind of terrorist activity? What are they basing these, you know, accusations on? There, ha there were some uh, violent incidents uh, during the period of 2012 and 2015, but the construction of the concentration camps, uh, based on various government bids, government documents uh, compiled by a German scholar, Adrian Zenz started in the late 2016. So when you look at the timing, uh, look at the method, uh, it defeats the purpose. Any country has a right to defend its national uh, boundaries, uh, has a right to defend uh, the safety of their own citizens. But the way that the China is conducting the, 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 uh, the existing uh, uh, modern-day concentration camp system, uh, 
uh, begs a big uh, question. What, what is the crime that a thought leader, an author, a former president, or a stage former performer, or athlete who are glorifying your nation in a soccer fields have anything to do with terrorism? Uh, you know, they, the fact that the Chinese says something three times does not make it true. The United States government, uh, time and time again, uh, as recent as the uh, last week uh, in New York, uh, top U.S. diplomat Mike Pompeo said that this has nothing to do with terrorism. So Chinese can continue to make this um, uh, engage in this disinformation campaign, and they can continue to use uh, their money to buy out silence. But the the question is very simple: What kind of world do we want? What do we tell the next generation that we saw something terrible happening and, and why we are did certain nothing? crimes are overlooked by the international community right. when they take place in? Chinese territory, right. um, and not in other places around the world. Well, I want to go back uh, to the testimonies that we read. You know, according to some accounts, detainees were forced to study communist propaganda. You mentioned it, and also, you know, some women said that they were, you know, forced to undergo abortions. Uh, what if you refuse? Do you get punished? How does it work inside these? Washington camps? Post reported just a couple of days ago testimonies of Uyghur women who went through the sexual abuse um, and, and, and they were given this chill, uh, chili, chili powder to use against their private parts. And they also given a mysterious pills testified by um, uh, two Uyghur survivors based in Washington. Uh, one of them cryingly told the audience here in New York during the uh, General Assembly side event that uh, she no longer can uh, conceive the government uh, forced her to go through sterilization. And also one of the victims cited in Washington Post stated that anyone fits in a certain age group, male or female, has to go to uh, sexual abuse in these camps. So the Chinese government um, engaging in this in multiple. There's another aspect that we haven't talked about, which is to export this um, repression, uh, harassment, to countries in Europe and here in the United States. When you go to uh, Uyghur-related events, uh, you see only a handful of Uyghur people even showing up in public events because they're afraid of being notified or noticed by the Chinese government. And speaking and, out, maybe the yes. Chinese government can track them. And yeah, and they have, uh, they have been, uh, my organization profiled individuals who have been directly harassed by the Chinese government, even some instance asked to spy for the Chinese government to monitor Uyghur, Uyghur community. So they've been uh, extremely aggressive uh, in diplomatic fronts. They've been very uh, 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 aggressive harassing the Uyghur uh, communities around the world on top of what they've been doing. And it's just this, uh, it's heart, uh, disheartening that it is so sad that uh, the scale and scope of the uh, uh, repression, this cultural genocide, uh, uh, as some experts call, is so serious. But because of the um, world's relationship with China, uh, people uh, decide to look the other way. Even some countries, you know, they experience the fascism, Holocaust, and, and know firsthand how stories end when a government regime targets a specific ethnic or religious minority. And yet, and Europe, European societies are dead silent. Uh, at least the United States government has been spearheading much of the diplomatic efforts. Well, Mr. Nori, the repression that you described, let's assume one can really withstand this kind of you know, vicious treatment. Is there a final exam or graduation process? How do you get out of these camps? How does it work? Um, the Chinese government claims that detainees eventually assimilate you know, back to society. So how does it work? Last week, the uh, United States Customs, Customs and Border Control detained um, some goods and products arrived to the United States from that part of the world. Uh, the, the suspicion is that these products were produced in labor camps. Those mm -hmm. labor camps were previously uh, concentration camps. So what are they doing with the people? They, uh, uh, they built crematoria around the, uh, uh, the camps. Uh, based on the disturbing news that we heard, uh, there are not man that many people leaving. The ones who were left were either le left very sick, sick and died soon after, 
or uh, we've been hearing from the survivors that the uh, people are dying in prison. So what do they do with the remaining ones? There's no graduation, there's no free will to leave the camps. Based on uh, one of the uh, uh, Uyghur experts uh, by European descent recently said that they're transferring the Uyghur detainees into forced camps. And speaking of transfer, you know, um the Chinese government had denied these camps existed since they began using them in 2014 until October 2018. That's when it officially legalized these camps. Now, in September, a drone footage emerged showing police leading hundreds of blindfolded and shackled Uyghur men from a train in what is believed to be a transfer of inmates in Xinjiang. A video posted on, anonymously on YouTube verified this uh, footage as authentic uh, by Australian Strategic Policy Institute. That's what they said. This is real. Did you pick up on any reaction by the Chinese government uh, on, on this video? When I saw it, I had two thoughts. One, um, on the back of the uh, prison uniform, uh, I saw the name of my ancestral hometown, Kashgar. Uh, it could be me. Um, wow. had, I, had I lived there, it could be one of those guys. And then two, um, we've been telling the world since last year that they need to be mindful about uh, the Chinese government's intent when they bring people to visit those Potemkin villages, uh, showing happy faces, you know, some empty camps claiming that we let people go. It verified that they're not letting people go, but they're transferring uh, a Uyghur individual's fits uh, in, within certain age group to inland Chinese prisons. This particular video, disturbing video that you're referring to, uh, counted about 600 uh, individuals. They look all young people. On top of these atrocities we've been discussing, there's also forced organ harvesting. Recently, during a uh, panel discussion at the uh, uh, influential think tank that I took part, one of the panelists said that the uh, the wait time for organ transplant have shortened significantly. So, and we recently saw a, um, a video, a promotional video produced by the Chinese government in Arabic uh, for this organ uh, transplant hospital in uh, Beijing. Uh, a UK-based uh, scholar uh, have done research and, uh, and written books about this topic. So I don't know where to begin and how to end this conversation. These are it's people like, who are alive, detainees yes. in these camps, and the government is simply using their organs. Organs, yeah, for profit, uh, for... Is, is there any kind of, you know, way to fight this by the international medical community, let's say, or certain medical institutions maybe banning organs originating from China? This, you know, the... the it's past time for action. This has to be a collaborative ev uh, effort uh, by the governments, societies, scientific communities, and uh, the business communities. Everybody's in, in, um, implicated in this business. When you look around the world, uh, especially security cameras, there's a company called Hague Vision that makes uh, one third of the world's security cameras. That is a Chinese camera company. And, when you look around, they've been, and even some pension funds in the United States here in New York State and California have been investing in this company. We have a scientist at Yale University help the Chinese government with DNA sequencer. We have uh, uh, professors still going to China. So it helping. has to be a shared effort yes, on uh, all different fields, according to what you're saying, in an international effort. We need bigger boat. Uh, to handle uh, the Chinese pressure in order to minimize a potential retaliation against a single state this has to be a collaborated uh, world effort you know sometime uh, the historians uh, Uyghur experts jokingly said that we need to have a Churchillian leadership to tackle this issue in, in a historic reference you know walking around um, or tiptoeing around the topic or just uh, 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 concerning too much about a country's uh, economic interest it does not go down well in this. We've seen this movie before. We know exactly how it ends. It just, uh, you know, it's a matter of uh, conscience. Uh, what side of the history one ought to be on? Um, 
you know, what are you going to tell your children that you know something and you did nothing, when, even though you had the power to uh, make an impact? That's how I'd like to finish this conversation, uh, Mr. Nouri. So you've been through such a traumatic, you know, <coughs> life-changing experience. What advice would you give to Uyghur families, for example, if you could convey a message to them being separated from their loved ones now? I, you know, the hope is the best weapon against uh, oppression. Um, we have we have seen some resilient people throughout the history. Uh, Jews, for example, they sacrificed six million of their population. Uh, it's easy for me to say it now, it, it, but I can appreciate the pain. But they have a country. You need to be stay hopeful. Uh, and also, um, the Chinese government systematically destroying the Uyghur language. Hebrew language is another example. You know, you need to be stay hopeful and keep individual and collectively whatever you can. Or at least speak out on behalf of their family members. It's very empowering, um, and also imp it's very empowering that you speak out on the people uh, uh, on behalf of the people that you don't even know. Which so, is what you yeah, are doing. Th thank you, Mr. Nouri Trukel. Thank you. We really appreciate your time. Thanks thank for you so being much. on the program. Thank you. And thank you all for watching and joining us today for the Investigative Journal Show. I'm Tal Henrik reporting from Times Square, New York. We'll be back with you next time. Thanks for watching.